Lisa, it looks like there's been a couple of them in the chat box. Okay, the first one being um, for Zong, or I can't pronounce your last name, I'm sorry, um, is what temperature is, was the, the digester, mesophilic or thermophilic? Oh, yes. Um, thank you for asking the question. It's the one we worked on, the, that digester was uh, mesophilic temperature range. Okay. Um, and then there was another question um, for Dr. Top. Uh, composting reduced antimicrobial resistant bacteria, but apparently didn't not to this, but didn't to the same extent of digester as the digester. So, what temperature was the digester? Was it um, mesophilic or thermophilic? Again, it was uh, mesophilic. <laughs> and then the last question that I see so far, but more questions can certainly come in. Um, could you describe how um, this for Dr. Or for future Dr. Wind, uh, could you describe how your how you prevented cross contamination between the plots? Absolutely. So there's a few measures taken, or a lot of measures taken, to make sure that there is no cross contamination between the plots. Again, we couldn't really control everything because we're in a field, but uh, some things we did was when we spread the manure in the compost and the fertilizers in each, uh, in each plot, we used different rakes and hoes that were specific for each plot that we were using or each treatment that we were using. And then in every single time we went and sampled or planted seeds or harvested the vegetables, we had on sterile booties and different gloves and we changed that between each plot as well as to not cross contaminate between within treatments. Um, let's see, we also, based on the design study and how we did this unbalanced block design of the treatments, we know that the wind direction of the field we were working in, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head which way it was going, but we did start with upwind was the control, then the inorganic chemical control, and then all the way down downwind was the raw manure. So to try to, in case there would be aerial contamination on that front, make sure the most upwind site was the actual control. Thank you, Lauren. Leslie, are there other questions in the Q&A box? I am seeing a couple of them. One is, um, have you done any uh, studies on degradation of antibiotics in waste milk? Has anybody done that? Uh, it's Ed here. No, uh, we haven't done that, and I can't think off the top of my head of any studies that would have done that. I know that's an issue. We, we didn't work on anything either, but we're trying to analyze some of the antibiotics in different streams, but maybe that's something we can include in the future. Okay. Okay. Um, so, go ahead. I'll just say a couple of things. I'm reading these questions here. So there are a couple of points about waste milk. Uh, at least in our part of the world, if the milk is coming from an ill, uh, from a cow that's receiving drugs, of course it's, it's set aside from the milk supply. It's given to calves, uh, again, in our part of the world. And calves, because of that, are likely kind of a hot spot for antimicrobial resistance in dairy operations. So that is kind of a concern. Uh, then there are a couple of questions here um, for vegetables, time of what practices do we recommend to reduce transfer of AMR to vegetables? So, and, and there's also animal feed. So increase the offset time between application and harvest if that's an option and pre-treat uh, if that's an option. Don't use raw manure on vegetables. Uh, the problem here is that we import vegetables from parts of the world like South America that may not manage manure the way we do. So that's why we've designed the experiments as we have. Best case, worst case scenarios. Um, that's all I've got on these ones. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, Lauren, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I agree with Ed there, and also to answer uh, Rick's question above, is that I really think that the ARBs, when we culture that from a culturing point of view, 
as, and I'm not gonna use the word risk here because I don't really know what the risk is to humans, just that it just differed based on the drug that we were looking at. We saw those differing trends, whether it increased that and then was continued to be detectable or then it went, it increased when it was applied, but then it decreased in the soil. So it really just depends on what drug you're looking at for ARBs and also uh, trying to get it down and maybe it's the wait time trying to get it down to get to those background levels again. Thank you. Um, we have another question here um, from Erica Rogers. Have any of the speakers done work with row crops and AMR? So corn, soy. Uh, we are currently working on hay, actually. Um, and so we have some experiments going on this year and in the past that we haven't published. Uh, what I can say is it looks like if you put manure on hay, the first cut afterwards, uh, under our climate conditions, if we extract the DNA from that cut and use these molecular tricks, we'll have more antibiotic resistance genes than, it, than hay from a control plot that didn't receive manure. The second and third cut, kind of as you'd expect, we don't see a difference. Um, so that is a, a conclusion. One of the things that we're doing this year is we're gonna do haylage. So we're moving towards our first cut. I'm not sure when it'll happen, but when it does, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll ferment that and see if that makes the problem go away. Mm, thank you. Um, we have another question here, back to the milk uh, from Alan Hart. So for milk, how do we balance the risks between feeding antibiotic containing milk to calves versus adding the milk to a slurry, which is then spread versus some other solution? Ed? Uh, yeah, I, I guess there probably isn't a great answer to that. What I would say is if, uh, the antibiotic in question is a penicillin type antibiotic. So a cephalosporin, uh, anything like that. If, if that antibiotic goes into a calf, it has the potential to promote resistance to that class of antibiotics in, in that animal. Those antibiotics are not at all persistent in the environment. So uh, there, I would say if the economics are right, uh, it, 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 the risk would be lower if that material goes into the manure and then it's land applied, recognizing that that comes with a cost to the producer. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. Let's see here. Um, we have a question here from Michael Brian Brown um, on aerosol risk. Can you comment on aerosol risk of infection for land application of raw manure? So I see a couple of questions. And then there's an, a follow-up from Carl on manure pathogens and wind drift kind of right. tied together. Right. Lisa, you're probably more familiar with this than I am, but I know of some studies that have been done in Texas, for example, looking at bacteria coming off of CAFOs or, or uh, uh, animals in feedlots, actually. Um, and detecting things. I would say that this is a bit of a knowledge gap that needs more research. And it would look at not only um, drift uh, at some distance, but also uh, uh, people working on these farms. Uh, so occupational exposure through the air. There's yeah. still a bit of a question about um, how important uh, airborne transmission is relative to, say, food or water. Yeah, I know there's work um, done by um, Elaine Barry at the ARS and Clay Center um, looking at wind drift of the shigatoxigenic E. coli from feedlots onto leafy greens and doing a, um, uh, looking at a number of different distances and, and also uh, adding insects into that mix. And based on her work, I think the um, vegetable growers in, in California were refining um, their recommendations for uh, the distance that you have to be from uh, downwind of a, a feedlot when you're planting. So there is some, there is some work there. And then 
Um, I imagine, although it was not mentioned in Elaine's study, so the the antimicrobial resistant bacteria would um, function, be transported in a similar manner to the non-antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, so you might be able to extrapolate from the pathogen studies to get an idea on, on antibiotic resistance. Uh, so Carl has another question here. Any thoughts about tree plantings to suppress wind drift or pathogens from CAFOs, like windbreaks? Hmm, interesting. Lauren, have, have you heard of anything like that? I have not, but very interesting. Zong, how about you? That's kind yes. of an engineering solution to a problem. Yes, actually, uh, one of my colleagues, they are working on these vegetative barriers to reduce odor and pathogens in between uh, CAFOs and the neighbor. So they just started working this since last year, and I probably have to go follow up with them and see what are sort the of results. I, that's, that's one of the ideas um, I, I heard of. Um, so, so I can probably share later more once, once they have results. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Um, I'm going to throw out, a, uh, I, have, I have two questions. I'll throw out one. Ed, you brought up the idea of occupational exposures. I'm wondering within the community, as, a, as an ag researcher, um, we're not really allowed to work with human subjects. Uh, any suggestions from any of the panelists or those listening in on how we could mm, facilitate or move forward on those kinds of, of studies? Well, there's a fair, fair body of literature out of, uh, I think, primarily out of the Netherlands, so out of Europe, looking at things like MRSA in the noses of pig farmers and finding that, that they're, um, you know, much more prevalent than the, the majority of the population. Um, how do we do this kind of work? Uh, I, I don't know. I can't. I don't have a specific answer. Uh, we it's certainly something. If anybody comes up with an idea of how to get that done and connect the different, you know, connect the different groups, that would that would be a um, a good piece of information to have. Um, I know there was a Marsa Epi study on people who live close to. Um, it came out of Johns Hopkins, a, a woman named Joan Casey. Um, and people who lived close to swine manure man application sites had a higher incidence of MARSA than those who didn't live close to the swine manure application sites. And it was assumed that it was airborne um, exposure. However, when they looked at the actual subtypes of the pathogen that the people carried, the even the people who had the increased levels didn't have the same kind of MARSA that came from the pig manure. So um, a, a little bit complicated results there. All well, right. I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. And um, I hope that we can continue some of these discussions offline. I encourage the webinar uh, participants to uh, look up and, and contact uh, the speakers. And um, with that, I'll close the webinar for today. Thank you for attending.